Good morning, everyone, and good evening to those of you joining us from the US. I'm Bambina Olivares, the Director of Programming for Manila House, and your moderator for today. Welcome to our webinar entitled, The Mind is Willing, but the Spirit Resists, Mental Health and Sports. This is presented to you in partnership with the Centre Medical Internacional, your premier medical outpatient clinic. So, as we know, in the light of the recent um, events um, in sports, we had um, Naomi Osaka withdrawing from Roland Garros and, um, and the recent events in the um, football at the Euro Europe, um, Europa 2021. Um, we know that it takes more than physical prowess to become an athlete. How does an athlete balance athletic performance and mental health? How do they stay fit physically and mentally? Our speakers today, which include elite athletes, coaches, sports figures, as well as a sports um, psychologist, will discuss the relationship between the body and the mind when it comes to sports. Before we begin the talk, allow me to introduce our speakers. We have with us Akiko Thompson, who is a TV host and champion swimmer. Olympic athlete Akiko Thompson began swimming at the age of six. She was part of the Philippine national swim team in Seoul, 1998, Barcelona, 1992, and Atlanta 1996. She garnered eight gold medals in five Southeast Asian games. She's a member and co-captain of the University of California Berkeley women's varsity team, four-year UC letter winner and two-time All-American. She attended the University of California at Berkeley, graduating with a degree in anthropology, and then earned an MBA at the Ateneo de Manila University. She later became a television host and journalist with Pro Productions at ABS-CBN. She was Secretary General of the Philippine Amateur Swimming Association and served as President of the Philippine Olympians Association, as well as Commissioner from 2008 to 2016 of the Philippine Sports Commission. She's a contributor to Winning Still, Essays from the Philippine Sports Landscape during the Pandemic 2021. Since 2011, she has been operating her own swim school, Akiko Thompson Swimming School. Tony de la Cruz, who is not joining us today, but has, um, has shared with us a video. As, uh, as you all know, the PBA basketball season has started, so he is um, in practice right now. But um, Anthony de la Cruz, more commonly known as Tony, is a professional PBA player. Playing 18 seasons for both the Shell Turbo Chargers and the Alaska Aces, he went on to be a central part of three titles with the Aces. Along with winning multiple championships, Tony was also a member of the 2007 Philippine national team that competed in FIBA Asia in Tokushima, Japan. After retiring in 2017, he was added to the ACES coaching staff and is also the director of the Alaska Power Camp, a grassroots program in the Philippines. Tony devotes his time to teaching basketball to all levels and has a passion for speaking about mental health and athletes whenever possible. Also joining us is Anton Del Rosario. He's the owner and player of um, FC Maharlika in a former Ascals team member. Anton is an American born Filipino footballer who plays as a right back or center back for Maharlika Manila, of which he is also co-founder and co-owner. He represented the Philippine national team from 2004 to 2018. The defender has gone on to score a few international goals, including the 2007 AFF championship against Malaysia. He has also played for clubs like Kaya from 1999 to 2014 as captain, Loyola Meralco Sparks uh, from 2014 to 2016, Ilocos United, Global Cebu, and MMFC. <clears throat> he has dedicated most of his life to developing the country's passion for football, whether on or off the field, as a businessman, host, and model. He set up Sevens Football League, or Sevens FL, the country's first seven-a-side football league with seven locations nationwide and across Asia. He was instrumental in bringing, the da bringing David Beckham to the Philippines with AIA. Additionally, he also founded a sports application called La Raw in 2017, a sports flat platform that helps you find your workout buddy. TJ Monotok is a sports cancer and a sports caster, sorry about that, and mental health advocate. He has been a sports commentator and new news broadcast journalist in the Philippines for over 20 years. He has covered games in the Philippines' top professional basketball league and top collegiate sports league in Manila, and travels the world to cover events like international football matches, the Southeast Asian Games, the NBA Finals, and the NBA All-Star Weekend. As a news reporter and news anchor, he covers varying stories on politics, business, technology, and health. 
In 2018, he finally he decided to finally share his story online on how, as a teenager, he battled and overcame depression and anxiety. Ever since it went viral, he has constantly been, been invited by universities and companies to share his story, to show how others can also discover the path to mental wellness. Years have passed, and with the help of many advocates like himself, lawmakers have finally enacted a Mental Health Act in the Philippines a few years back. He is now based in the San Francisco Bay Area as the North America News Bureau Chief of ABS-CBN. He continues to push for his advocacy of mental health and wellness through virtual events, podcast interviews, and conversations with his highly engaged social media followers. And finally, Dr. Natasha Esteban Ipak is an adolescent medicine specialist with CMI. She's a pra um, in BGC. She graduated from the University of Santo Tomas, completed her residency training in pediatrics and her fellowship training in adolescent medicine at the UP Philippine General Hospital. Dr. Epac specializes in treating adolescent concerns such as health and wellness, mental health, chronic illness, and teen mom issues. She also does psychosocial screening and assessment. She's a fellow of the Philippine Pediatric Society and a diplomat of the Philippine Society of Adolescent Medicine Specialists Incorporated. She has conducted various lectures on diverse health concerns about adolescents and has published research throughout her career. Our floor will be open for Q&A after a speaker's discussion. For questions, kindly send them through the Q&A box below. You may also stream this webinar through our YouTube channel after the session. Um, it should be up in about um, a day or so. So, <clears throat> sorry. Um, so now let's start. I'm going to give the floor to our first speaker, Akiko Thompson. Akiko, I wanted you to talk about your journey as an Olympic athlete and how mental health has played a, a huge part in this and how, how you continue to advocate for mental health even after you've, you've finished um, your career as a competitive swimmer um, has ended. Thanks. Um, thank you. Yes, thank you, Bambina, and uh, for inviting me to be here this morning. It's, it's great to be part of this conversation and just to share um, from my own experience. Um, you know, as, as a as a elite competitive athlete, I guess uh, the assumption can be that we really um, spend more time developing ourselves physically, um, but really <clears throat> that couldn't be farther from the truth. Um, mental component is such a huge aspect of an elite athletes. Uh, there are different things, pressures that um, competitive athletes have to do deal with expectations. I think it's also, you know, just around the whole realization that there are many eyes watching you. Um, and so you just have, you know, it, it's, uh, it doesn't happen, at least for an elite athlete competing at that level, you know, you don't just wake up one day and you're thrown there, but, you know, through uh, comp a series of uh, competitions that progressively get more intense, you kind of learn how to deal with these pressures and these expectations. And, uh, you know, for me personally, uh, visual, visual, visualization, visualizing my races, uh, thinking about them beforehand, speaking about it with my coach, you know, what was part of how I uh, also just prepared for my races. Um, so it is a mental, the mem mental preparation is a huge component for an athlete uh, when, when they're within the sport. But I think also another aspect um, is when athletes transition out of the sport, um, you know, when your whole life is revolving around your sport and your sporting schedule. Uh, you know, my mother used to joke about how so I majored in swimming in college. And I think there's, you know, there's truth to that and that just everything revolves around it. And so that when you transition uh, out of sport, it can be very um, shocking to the system. You know, there's, um, there's a huge hole and gap. And, and for many athletes, you know, that's a time of reflection and thinking about, oh gosh, is this it? Is there anything else I'm good at? that I can do. And for me personally, you know, that, that took me a year or two to just to um, a low, low period of my life, just trying to figure out what next. Um, 
So that's another component. And then when you think, but you think about athletes in this day and age, I think it's I, even more challenging uh, because I think everything is magnified with social media. There's uh, so many more people commenting and, you know, and, and, and how do you process all, all that, right? You know, we're human beings and, and you, you can't help but notice the things that people are saying. And so I think that that's another component uh, that, that makes it very challenging. And, um, and then on top of that, also just this past year, you know, COVID has been challenging for everyone. And for those athletes that have been dreaming about competing at the games, you know, the whole uncertainty of that uh, if the Tokyo was going to happen and just navigating around how, how do we do things now when there's so many protocols and so many restrictions and uh, it, it just adds, makes it a, even more difficult and challenging. And so, you know, for me personally, I'm, I'm a very a reflective person and journaling is something that has always uh, helped me process. Uh, I think it's just, very important for for people to be mindful you know it uh, of of how we how we're doing you know it's uh, wellness is mind body and spirit and um so you know this past year of covid you know for me it was really just being mindful about the things activities the habits i was doing i i knew that being physically active was is important um i i was intentional about you know i wanted to be under the sun you know i, I you know and intentional also of, of counting the blessings despite everything that was taken away from us. You know, there were things that we could be grateful for. And so um, I guess we all have our different uh, tools in our kit, uh, but I think we cannot neglect, you know, these, uh, we have to be very conscious also of how we're doing emotionally, spiritually, uh, and, and that we're doing the right um, things to care for ourselves. Um, I, later on, maybe I can just go into further detail of some of the lessons I, le I learned in, in sport. Uh, some of them were painful, but there were also good lessons for me. Um, that I, I had to learn uh, in sport. Um, but I guess that's, that's where I'll stop right now and uh, just leave room for the others to um, contribute to the conversation and uh, yeah. Thanks so much, Akiko. Thanks for being so candid and sharing all, um, sharing your journey with us. Um, and especially I like that you spoke about your life post your athletic career and how it comes with a whole host of other issues as well, right? It's, Thank you. Yeah, um, it's not just one time in your life. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Um, we'll listen now to um, Tony De La Cruz, who, who um, prepared a short video for us today. Hi, my name is uh, Anthony De La Cruz. Everyone knows me as Coach Tony. I am currently the assistant coach for the Alaska Aces. And I played 18 years in the PBA as a professional athlete. And I think it's very important to talk about mental health and athletes. And I don't think we talk about it enough. Uh, for those that don't know me, you know, I did play 18 years and I, I had a picture perfect career uh, outside looking in. You know, I was getting paid a lot of money. Uh, I was on good teams. Um, I was actually the captain uh, of the team that I was on. Um, we won some championships. You know, um, I got to play on the national team. I got to represent the country. And I had a family. I had a wife, kids. And I didn't understand how to, to process a lot of this stuff from, from the pressures of being an athlete. And it caught up to me one day. And you know, I made some bad choices, but at the end of the day, I got diagnosed with clinical depression during uh, the, the heyday of my, my career. And I realized that it was something that I wasn't, I wasn't ashamed of, but at the same time, as an athlete, especially as a male athlete, you're always socialized and taught, you know, to be tough, suck it up, you know, why you're not allowed to have these feelings. And I didn't know how to process all that. And throughout the years, I've, you know, I've obviously learned how to manage stress 
um, cope with stress. Stress is inevitable. But I think the demands right now on athletes are at an all-time high. And of course, there's going to be pressure jobs, pressure situations. But we need to educate young athletes especially about how to get help, how to, to manage their stress. Think about the demands that an athlete faces. Uh, and, and I'm not talking about professional at this point. Think about a student athlete someone who's going to go to school each and every day, they have to get an education, but they also have to make training, they have to make practice. And then from that practice, um, the physical demands on their body, and then the mental demands on their, on their body, plus they have to go home and study and they have to make sure that they maintain a certain high GPA. And, you know, outside looking in, some people will say, well, that's, that's what it is to be a student athlete. And that's why athletes get, get scholarships. And that's why, you know, they're, they're placed in this, this box in this category. But I think we 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 tend to forget that they are human, and think about the demands that they go through when they fail. Social media is you know, it's made our world smaller, but it also causes forms of anxiety, especially for these athletes. And I can speak from experience as a basketball player. You know, I can't speak from for other sports, but as a basketball player, my self worth was was really really tied into my performance. How much money am I making? How many points am I scoring? Um, how many rebounds? How many minutes am I playing? How big is my contract? And when I didn't perform at a high level, I tied that into, well, I'm, I, I'm, I'm a, not of value to the, to the organization. And I think we need to change that mentality because a lot of times athletes will get depressed or they'll feel low, they'll feel down because they're not performing. And again, competition is important. We need to, to, competition is going to, you know, bring out the best in people. But at the end of the day, we need to teach athletes, teach uh, these young kids how to be able to, to manage all this and be okay with all this. I found meditation. I found yoga. I found a new spirituality in, in trying to stay in the moment. And I think that's really helped me mentally. I try to teach that to the young athletes now, whether it be on Alaska or young basketball players or other athletes that I meet. It's okay to mess up. It's okay to fail. That's part of the learning process. It's not the end of the world. How do you stay in the moment? How do you maintain levels of confidence when you're doing well? How do you bring up your confidence when you're doing bad or when you're doing, not doing so well? I don't like to use the word bad. But at the end of the day, I think we need to start having these conversations about mental health. And I think it's important here in the Philippines, especially because we stigmatize the word mental health or the words mental health. People automatically think you're crazy and it's so dismissive. And I think if we can have honest conversations and dialogue about what it is to be healthy mentally, then we're going we're gonna to start to go in the right direction. I use this analogy all the time when I talk to people about what it is to, to be mentally uh, okay. And as an athlete, if you sprain your ankle, at some level, you, you'll be able to still run or probably walk. And depending on how the, the, the severity of the ankle sprain, right? So if you sprain your ankle, you might be able to continue on with the game or with the play, but you'll alter the way you run. You'll alter the way you walk. And at some point, because you're limping, maybe your knee will have to, to bear the burden. And if it's not your knee, maybe it's your thigh. And if it's not your thigh, maybe it's your hip. And it goes all the way up. It's all connected throughout your whole body. But at some point, something's going to give. And I say it's the same thing with mental health. If you experience some kind of trauma, uh, some kind of adverse situation, and you don't get the proper resources or support that you need, especially with, with processing a loss, processing being cut, processing you know, some kind of adversity, you don't understand or, or fully know how to, to grasp it and you keep it inside, you suppress it. At some point, just like this ankle sprain, it's going to come out in another way. And it might come out in, in maladaptive coping strategies, alcoholism, gambling, uh, domestic violence, womanizing, you know, again, I'm not here to judge anybody, but that's why it's important to have these conversations about mental health. That's why it's important to have a balance and learn and teach, teach young athletes, especially how to cope and how to manage their stress. So for me, it's the biggest thing right now that, that aside from nutrition, aside from, you know, preventative exercises, mobility, flexibility, 
mental health is, is one of the, those pieces of the pie that we need to figure out and, and address so that we can have healthy athletes uh, and athletes that are going to thrive and succeed. Thank you. Okay. And, oh, it's still recording. Oops. <laughs> Thanks for that, Tony. Um, thanks for providing that video. And um, I guess you're now in the whole, um, in the midst of the PBA season. And so I hope, you know, your, your team is all motivated and in the right state mentally and physically. And now I turn you over to um, Anton Del Rosario, who is joining us from um, LA. Um, it's, I hope it's not too late there, Anton. <laughs> Oh, no, it's it's actually perfect time, and <laughs> it's good to see your face. It's been a while. Yeah, it's nice to see you, yeah. Yeah, um, it's also nice to yes, see you, please. Kiko, as well. <laughs> so yeah. first, I want to say thank you very much um, to you, Bambina, and to Manila House for having us. Um, you know, it's an honor to be selected, especially amongst these characters over here um, in the sports world, right? Um They've done a lot for the country, and I, I really appreciate you putting me with them. Um, so going to mental health, right? Uh, Tony and Akiko um, explained how critical it is to address this. You know, as a player and growing up, um, football was always my, my end goal, my, my passion. It's what got me through everything. Right. It's what I would go to uh, to get away. It's what I would go to to make me happy. Um, then once football got a little bit more serious, right, um, we saw that the leagues were starting up. We saw that the competition was getting heavier. We saw that, you know, people were successful. People weren't successful. Guys dropping in and out left and right. Right. Um, you start seeing that and things like that don't make you love the game so much anymore, right? At some points, it takes a toll on you. And sometimes it comes to a point where you kind of fall out of love with the game. And these are hardships that people, you know, people outside of, uh, you know, outside of that whole, I guess, team aura, they don't really understand, right? Um, it does, it takes a toll on you playing at a certain level um, and devoting your life to, uh, to a sport. Um, we, we think we find it to be a religion, right? I mean, we, we live and die for it. And if it's not going the right way, then that, that takes a toll on everything. Um, and it could lead you down a, a very bad spiral. Right. At one point in my career, um, I was having a tough time with it. Uh, I got, um, I guess, cut from the national team in 2012. Uh, I had some issues with the, with the coach. Right. Um, uh, and then it just it affected me in, in a very difficult way. It affected my play with my club teams. Um, and it kept me out of the team for two years. Um, 2014, I was able to make it back onto the national team. And then once again, my game started going up again, right? These are the ups and downs um, uh, with the player's career. And this is sort of something for people outside listening um, to be able to understand what happens in a player's head during their career, right? So with these ups and downs, it definitely takes a toll. And what Akiko brought up Kiko brought up something very important. Um, and this was talking about after a player's career, right? Um, the mental part during a player's career, it's always there, as Tony mentioned, you know, the stresses, um, you know, you can fall into depression, uh, things don't go well. Um, but I think one of the hardest parts is, is afterwards, right? Afterwards, a lot of people don't know where they're going to go. A lot of people don't know what they're going to do. As Akiko said and mentioned, what else am I good at? Is this all I'm good at, right? Um, you know, luckily with me, I was able to transition into different things to help push the sport forward. Um, but I have seen some people who weren't so lucky, you know, and some people who may even still be struggling with um, being able to figure out what they want to do after, after, the sport after 
not being able to play the game that they love anymore, right? Um, and these are difficult, right? And this is what makes me worry. And this is what I think a lot more focus should be on about, you know, there are agents out there and these agents who are supposed to sort of mold the players and help the players along their career, a lot of them don't really care about the players um, afterwards, right? And I think that's what should a lot of attention should be put on, you know? How can players get help after their careers? Because a lot of players after their careers is when they have a hard time. Um, and like I said, with me, I was lucky. It wasn't my toughest time, but I can tell you, um, I did have some tough times trying to figure out what I would end up doing, right? Um, but going forward, COVID happened and it ran into, um, let me take my headphones off real quick. I think we're having a hard time with the, the speaker. So, I mean, after my career, I was able to do what I love, create the sevens football league, take that across to six different uh, cities across the country, um, expand into Brunei as well. Um, looking to kick that off later on this year. Um, but COVID hit and all of a sudden, once again, no more football, right? Uh, that then put a lot of people into a bad position, right? Mental health. It was it was going around a lot but I gotta say I I very much felt into fell into a deep depression over COVID at one point in time um you know there was no football going on nobody was able to see each other um I was staying on my own for a little bit and then you know everything was dark it was just there was nowhere to go nothing to do um, I had no motivation and I wouldn't even want to pick up phone calls from people. Um, but, you know, all of this, you got to look at it. It's, it's a part of life. It's the ups and downs. And as an athlete, we look at it as another, just another obstacle, right? And we need to push past it, I guess. And with that being said, it made me take a step back. And with all of this COVID going on, I was able to pick out and start looking at the positives, right? I stopped one day and said, if I keep on going down this path, it could lead me down a very dark road. So I was able to reach out to some people, um, had to talk with some people. Uh, they got me on to uh, the right way. They got me back. They got me focused. Um, and, and then all of a sudden, an opportunity comes around where we get to start a professional team, right? So uh, during the pandemic, my team, who I brought on to help me out through the Sevens Football League, right, they came to my support, and they were able to help us create a professional team that now represents um, in the top level here. So I guess um, when it comes out to the COVID situation and the mental health, looking at the positives, it's always looking at who your security blanket is around you, who's there around you to be able to help you out of these things. And I was able to find some people to do it. So looking at the positives was, was my main thing to definitely take out of um, this whole COVID and the whole mental situation, and also what opportunities and what changes can we do to benefit whatever we're doing, all right? And all of this ends up leading to, I think, trust in the man above, right? Having the trust in him, he's gonna create that path and he's gonna be able to uh, show you the way. Thank you guys for listening. Take care. Thanks so much, Anton. I mean, I'm just, I just have to mention how I'm really pleased to hear and touch that everyone's been so honest and candid with their experiences and showing that, you know, there's more behind the game than what you see, than the um, athletic performance that you see. And I think no one here has 
kind of seen it more than um, our next speaker, TJ Manotok, because he actually documents all these things as a sports um, broadcaster, sports journalist. And, and he's also battled with his own um, struggles with depression. So um, TJ, sh shall I turn it over to you? Hi. Thanks, Bambina. Can you guys hear and see me? Yes, yes, perfectly. Thanks. Uh, uh, great to see Anton. Uh, great to see Akiko. Really good to see Tony. I've interviewed them uh, several times. And, you know, what's interesting, though, is I was telling myself, we've never talked about this, which is great. It's great we're having this conversation now because we've always just talked about their sport. You know, Akiko, I didn't see her at her prime, but we were talking about her work with uh, Philippine Sports and, of course, Tony when he would be, you know, coaching already with Alaska and with the uh, junior NBA. But um, thank you first and foremost to Manila House for, for doing this uh, event and having this important conversation. And, and um, you know, it, it, it's interesting that, that uh, I come after the three <laughs> friends of mine who are athletes and, and um, seeing the commonality of their journeys. And I'm, and I'm observing a lot as well um, with what I'm learning in the last three years since 2018. 2018 was the year I did my... I came out with my story. I told my story through a, a video that I put on YouTube and Facebook. For those who haven't seen it, you can just Google TJ Manotok and you will be all right and you'll see it. And it basically um, takes you on a journey of how I, you know, what I went through as a teenager with uh, depression and anxiety. But um, shortly after I came out with my video in 2018, um, one of the first big names that I saw in the news that came out uh, about uh, his struggles with depression and with, with even with suicidal attempts was Michael Phelps. And uh, I'm sure Akika knows this story very well too about, you know, the greatest swimmer of all time. And, and yet you really scratch your head and wonder why did he dip into depression and what was it all about? And at the time at, I didn't get to learn enough yet about his story about the why, but what I, what I was pleased to see then was his proactive action that he was helping, uh, you know, organizations with children, specifically the Boys and Girls Clubs here in the U.S., in terms of um, em building emotional resiliency. So I love the fact that aside from giving awareness, he was already taking proactive steps about how to basically strengthen kids um, and, you know, and, and how to prevent, um, if it can be prevented, the incidences of, of um, depression and anxiety by making kids more resilient. Fast forward to 2019, shortly before the pandemic, I was in a personal development seminar event in LA and I, and I met a guy um, first of all he was speaking it was you know part of a of this big workshop and he just you know spoke up and shared his story and he says that he was a Brazilian swimmer and that he was at the top of his game he was once the world champion and he also almost committed suicide and I, it was just mind-boggling to me to to realize it was exactly the same story as Michael Phelps Eventually tracked him down after the, the seminar, and his name is Fernando Scherer. Um, you can Google it and see a bit of his story. But when I eventually spoke to him and spent time with him, he was telling me his story was exactly the same as Michael Phelps. They worked so hard in their careers, like what, what um, Akiko was saying, as elite athletes. And yet when they get to the pinnacle of success and when it ends, they end up with that dark question of what now? Because they had given themselves, they've given so much of their life to that particular career that that sport that that was their whole lives and when it's taken away from you and when you reach your goals of gold medals gold medal gold medals what's next and they suddenly felt the emptiness and then it was as a sports journalist and as a as somebody who's an advocate for mental health it was so fascinating and enlightening to see that side of it and how you see that commonality especially for the elite athletes and, and how important it is for them now to tell their story to give it back to the youth who are getting into sports, uh, who want to be elite athletes and, and how they're learning so much more now, how they can prevent the burnout, how they can find that balance, as Tony was talking about. Um, one lesson I'll never forget learning from the interviews I've done is with um, our Kababayan uh, NBA champion coach, Eric Spolstra of the Miami Heat. I interviewed him, this is in 2000, I think 13, the year of their first championship um, with the big three, with Dwayne Wade, LeBron James, Chris Bosh. And I remember asking him what it was like dealing with all the egos of these professional athletes, not just professional athletes. These are, you know, uber superstars on his team. And I'll never forget what he told me. He told me that 
the the mindset that he has embedded in his team from day one is that they have to operate um, by comp compartmentalizing their lives. Meaning if you can imagine a vitamin container when you have Monday to Friday or Monday to Sunday and you got different compartments for AM, PM, that's what I envisioned right away. And he said, in the basketball court, they are just who they are, playing their roles. This guy's a power forward. This guy's a point guard. This guy's a center. And that's just, I'm the coach and this and that. Outside the court, then there's something else. Then they're the, they're the parent. Then they're the entrepreneur. Then they're the endorser. And he's made it a point to really make clear cut those boundaries. And I think that's such a powerful mindset to have when you're involved in elite sports. Like right now, that's what Michael Phelps um, is advocating for. If you want to learn more about his story, look up um, this podcast that he guested in recently um, on uh, the podcast of Tim Ferriss. Just type Tim Ferriss and Michael Phelps. I think he was with another good friend of his, one of the best Australian swimmers. Like he, he nicknamed him Haki. I forget his first name, but uh, that's what he calls him. And I'm sure Akiko knows who I'm talking about. But it's it's interesting to see the commonalities of how elite athletes, you know, who have succeeded, like Anton and and, and Tony and, and, and Akiko, and how you reach a level, then there's this dip. And I think it's 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 great that there's, you know, as Akiko said, social media makes it more magnified now, makes it more difficult. That's why Naomi Osaka, you know, feels the pressure and knows when to take a day off now, <laughs> knows when to take a, a tournament off, even though it's going to cost her, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars. But at the same time, it's a double-edged sword, but I think we can use it as a weapon for information, for inspiration. With more and more athletes coming out now, um, they can share their stories where, People can learn from them, not just young athletes, but people in general. We look to sports for inspiration. We look to sports for lessons learned, you know, from all of our sports champions. There's something we always get out of it as fans, whether we're an athlete or not. But now I think it's also very helpful to look to sports to see where we can find that balance, where we can find mental wellness and, as Akiko mentioned, holistic wellness. And um, if we can find those athletes who have found that, you know, and like, you know, one of the guys I look at now is like LeBron James. He's actually the endorser of a meditation app named Calm. I mean, I was driving around here in San Francisco two years ago and I see billboards of LeBron James with his eyes closed with the headphones because he's endorsing a meditation app, which is great. Now that you see the, the best athletes advocating for mental wellness and meditation and mindfulness, that's a wonderful message, message to send more than, you know, the highlight dunks, the bling bling, the championship rings and all that. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm confident, I'm hoping and praying that this continues. This is a trend that we can, you know, continue to share this story. We can amplify their messages. We can help save lives. And I'm sure we can help touch many, many lives as we continue to have discussions like this. So once again, thank you to Manila House Bambina for having this, for this, having this event. Thank you for inviting this, you know, exceptional cast of characters. And I'm humbled to be part of it. And I can't wait to hear from Dr. Natasha as well. So I'll, and now, for now, and I'll, I'll have some of the questions later, but I'll pass it back to you. Thank you. Thanks so much, TJ. Um, thanks again for your openness. And like I've said, you've seen it all, right? Because you've been documenting this throughout your career. And you've had your own struggles to deal with. So, um, you know, and, and I like the sense of compassion as well and understanding that you bring to, to the entire issue. Um, I'd like to turn you over now to um, Dr. Natasha Ipat, um, who will bring a medical expert's point of view on the topic. And um, she is a specialist with CMI. CMI is mentioned earlier as our partner for today and a premier outpatient medical clinic located in BGC. It offers consultations by phone, by video or in person, as well as laboratory and diagnostic procedures. So uh, with that introduction, um, let me turn you over to CMI's adolescent uh, medicine specialist, Dr. Natasha Esteban Ipa. Thank you Dr. very Natasha. much, Bambina. Hi. Hi, good morning. Thank you very much. So while um, they're setting up my slides, um, I would like again to thank uh, Manila House and CMI for the opportunity to really be here. Um, really an honor and a privilege to be with the people I just get to watch before, <laughs> at least in TV. Uh, now, um, Akiko, Tony, Anton, and TJ gave their own experiences, and nothing beats that, really, in terms of sending our message of how important mental health really is in sports. But I have the task of summarizing what it is that they actually said, so allow me to do so maybe not based on my experience as an athlete or um, as TJ <laughs> um, reporting it, um, but as a physician who actually handles a lot of physician, uh, a lot of patients um, with mental health, 
Now, um, sports literally make someone move. But for us, um, but for me, I mean, let me point it out why we should actually have a move for mental health in sports. So next slide, please. Um, let me just move you with four general points that was practically discussed in this session. But let me start off with what um, Phil Davis, an American mixed martial artist, once said. That the mental game is the entire game. The physical is only an extension of what you're capable of doing mentally. If you're fatigued mentally, your body is fatigued. If you're frustrated, your body is now fatigued and it, is, it isn't moving as fast and it doesn't look as sharp. Mental toughness and the power of your mind is just really unbelievable. So my first point in my move point is, next slide please, number one, is that mental health is really well. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So mental health is important in every stage of life, be it from childhood, be it adolescent, even throughout our adulthood. And because mental health, as WHO defines it, is not the mere absence of mental, uh, of poor mental health, and mental health is, they're actually not the same with mental illness. Okay? They're not the same thing. Because a person can actually experience poor mental health, yet not be diagnosed with a mental illness. On the other hand, a person diagnosed with a mental illness can actually experience good physical, mental, and even social well-being. So again, WHO defines uh, mental health as not the mere absence of mental illness, but it is actually a state of well-being in which an individual realizes his or her own abilities, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to his or her society. Now, practically, mental health is just a way of describing our emotional, psychological, and even social well-being. So it affects how we think, how we feel, and how we act. And it also helps us determine how we actually handle stress, even relate to others, and just make healthy choices. And next slide, please. One way to enhance mental well-being and protect our mental health is really by participating in sports, right? That's why sports have been um, known or is really um, known to have a strong and positive influence on mental well-being and even some mental illnesses. So it can just be, um, it, I'll just narrow it down to three as to why um, it is very um, helpful. So one is because of the neurobiological influences. So our brain Circuitry is actually affected by the neurotransmitters, by the neurotropic factors, even the hormones and all these during sports, um, these would be released or they would release um, these natural chemicals that would just really improve the concentration, the mood, making one um, happier, more relaxing, even more optimistic. Next, sports also benefit, um, not yet, um, so next is that sports also benefits mental well-being just by being able to enhance the self-efficacy and mastery. So if we are good at something, right? If we have control over something that they enjoy, like sports, it actually boosts our self-confidence, our self-esteem. So that positive self-concept would create um, emotional well-being and just have a good impact on the quality of life. Sports also makes us have a goal or purpose, which also adds to the meaning and value for daily life. And lastly is the social factor, wherein sports would allow um, the athletes or even just regular um, people enjoying sports to have social interactions and just be supported by their family, teammates, even their coaches. Right? It adds up to the sense of belongingness and connectedness. So sports and physical activities are actually even used to prevent and treat mental and neurodegenerative disorders. So truly, mental benefits cannot be overstated. Uh, next slide, please. So my next point, uh, my four-point move, is that opportunities come with challenges. Now, um, Akiko, um, Tony, TJ, um, were able to discuss and really share with us um, that even if they're actually enjoying sports or even if they actually found the benefit of sports, there are also a lot of negative experiences with it, right? Next slide, please. So they would actually experience mental illness just like the general population would do. But aside from that, they would also have um, these um, sports-related 
mm-hmm. mental illnesses or mel- mental issues related to their sports. So that would include um, the specific port- sports demands. So that includes the physical demand, um, just really having to go through the training, having to wake up early. So as mentioned even earlier, um, you have to be, a, especially for student um, athletes, some would, it's practically like having two full-time jobs, right? One is their academics, the other one is their sports. So being engaged in these sports, at the same time, being um, doing their academics, that would actually mean um, less time for their, um, for their pleasure, less time for their sleep, even for their self-care. Another thing is the social demand as what was highlighted by the four earlier, really the pressure and the expectations to perform well, more so to win, that is actually a bit heavy for them. And this would really be from the parents, relatives, even the coaches, or even the organization or the sport the sport organization themselves, right? Because they're the ones who would really push them to really be successful. And Akiko um, initiated that really the advent of social media is very, very um, contributory to how it, how it is really different now as it was before because um, they would actually highlight um, success very much while they would also um, pick up the failures, which would really spread fast. You know, like even if it just happened a few seconds ago, like everybody would be able to know it from, from every part of the world because of the advent of our social media. And add to that, um, because of that, sometimes they also experience the bullying, the threats, the harassment, even the criticisms associated with it. Next would be the financial gain or loss involved. Um, of course, some would really um, be doing sports, especially if it would be for their scholarship or just for their opportunity to, sh- to study and be employed. Um, um, not as much mentioned, but having injuries or having chronic pain is also a concern for our athletes because sometimes they would um, need to temporarily break from the sports, but more so if they would have to totally stop engaging in the sports they love. So which is somewhat related to the next one, to the retirement, which again, Akiko and PJ was already mentioning um, how really the transition to like finding yourself or like um, looking for the, or filling that hole that was actually missed when you stop doing the sports that you like. And also again, the, the effect of the pandemic, right? The canceled and suspended sports events, even the, the lockdown, like the isolation, somehow the athletes would, you know, um, um, lose a bit of their self-identity and you know, just the uncertainty of when it will resume, that also adds up to the burden. So again, aside from the baseline risk of the general population in having mental illness, those engaged in sports who do have an additional stress, um, physiological and psycholo- psychological challenges, which may precipitate our mental disorders. But the problem is, next slide please. I would like to quote um, Marty Fish from what he said. Mental health is not very easy to talk about in sports. It's not perceived as very masculine. We're so trained to be mentally tough in sports. To show weakness, we're told in so many words, is to deserve shame. But I am here to show weakness, and I am not ashamed. So my third point is, next slide, please. We really need to validate their vulnerabilities. Next slide, please. So athletes would really excel at everything, right? They're motivated. They do embrace challenges. They're championed to be mentally tough. But these same strengths are actually what would also make athletes reluctant to seek for help, right? So they're actually really vulnerable. They would not tend to seek for support, mainly because of the stigma, as one mentioned, because it was it would expose their weaknesses, making them risk losing either their contracts, um, lose financial gains, or they would really just lose whatever that it is that they enjoy doing, or even their own identity. But also, there is also a lack of understanding about mental health and in its influence on their performance. And lastly, it's just the culture of mental toughness. So there really is a perception that the health-seeking sign is a sign of weakness. So how can we validate it? Next slide, please. So for stigma, we help destigmatize um, mental illness. And it's not just really for athletes. It's, it's supposed to be for everyone. So as 
uh, mentioned by Anton earlier, it's okay not to be okay. You know? um, it's normal not to feel our best all the time. So we just need to reassure and encourage them instead that there is in, instead and just tell them that you know that there is something we can do about it and that you know we understand what they're going through. Next, for the lack of understanding about mental health, um, we need to increase our mental health literacy, but it's also about time that we just not learn about mental health, but also promote it. That's why I really appreciate this webinar that we're having this morning. Um, we need um, each and every one to really help us advocate for mental health and well-being. Um, you know, even as simple as emphasis on proper diet, exercise, sleep habits, these are very important. And for the culture of mental toughness, it also takes strength to admit our vulnerabilities. So really admitting the weakness is actually a form of mental toughness by itself. So if they do admit it, please do help take care of these mental health concerns. They okay? don't just shut it off. Okay? There are treatments available in helping them cope. And at times, just even listening to them would really be helpful. But aside from taking care of those who have mental health disorder, it's also important for us to next slide, please, to prevent mental health disorder. So screening is also one important way um, for us to really help um, address this. So for us, not really for me even, not just as a physician, but as a family member, as a friend, or even as a colleague, we need to watch out for you know, the signs of distress already present. So if they would be presenting, for example, with signs of withdrawal, agitation, if they're feeling extremely sad or with low energy, any changes in sleep, eating, in sleeping or eating patterns, if there is um, weight gain or weight loss, if they do express um, hopelessness or if there are any forms of violence, please ask. You know, if you notice something, just ask for help. And help us, you, you can refer them out, right? Um, I would just like to emphasize, because as a me an adolescent medicine specialist, no, um, it's very important to really identify, especially among our adolescents, and during early adulthood. You know, um, it is really, really the time wherein they would really take sports and, you know, engage in sports or um, this, and really, sports play an important role during this time. But more than that, it is actually during their adolescence wherein they're at high risk for, um, for really um, maintaining or obtaining these mental health conditions, such as just in the general population, according to WHO, half of all mental health conditions would start by 14 years of age, but most cases are undetected and untreated. So really, we do need to really emphasize that prevention would really play a big role. And for my last point, let me just quote um, Vikram Patel, a psychiatrist, and listed as one of the world's um, 100 most influential people that said, there is no health without mental health, and mental health is too important to be left to, to the professionals alone. Mental health is everyone's business. So my last point is for everyone can and should help. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So in solving the mental health concerns of our athletes, so even, again, even the general public, we have to have a holistic and multidisciplinary team. Um, it is not just the responsibility of the health care provider, but it is everyone's responsibility. So this is um, just citing a study by Purcell. He pointed out that we do need to develop a comprehensive mental health framework to support our athletes. And this would include not just the athlete themselves, but it would also include the microsystem, meaning their coaches, their team members, family members, loved ones. The exosystem, meaning the wider sporting environment, the athlete sports, its rules, and the governing body, and even the macro system. So it's the role of the national and international sporting system, even the media. So truly, each and every one can take part. And Aside from, again, all those, just by helping us, you know, those I mentioned earlier, so help us by breaking stigma, promoting and advocating mental health, help us take care and prevent mental health disorders. So to summarize, um, next slide, please. Sports really makes an individual move, right? But we should also remember that we should also make mental health in sports move because one, mental health is well, 
Two, opportunities come with challenges. Three, we need to validate their vulnerabilities. And four, everyone can and should help. And for my last move, though it is true that not everyone would suffer from mental health, but everyone has mental health, right? So we simply have to look inside us. And I always want to remind everyone about this one. Next slide, please. Please read it with me. It says, mental health begins with me. Yes, because mental health begins with ourselves and we have to model the importance of self-care ourselves. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Natasha. Thanks for that very comprehensive um, presentation with all the different aspects of mental health and what we should look into. And, and you mentioned something. I'd like to get all our, our panelists um, on gallery view at the moment uh, for now. If you could all turn on your um, cameras um, and unmute, if you don't mind. Anton, you still there? Yeah, no, I wanted to ask, um, you talked about, um, Dr. Natasha, you talked about the whole ecosystem, right? So yeah. where you also had media and um, the government, national sports associations. I wanted to ask our panelists, but maybe I'll start with Anton. You know how we just had the Europa um, Cup, right? The champ, uh, not champ, UEFA Cup, where England was defeated by Italy. And there was a lot of backlash, right? Against the three black players, which was terrible. So have you received that kind of, um, have you received that kind of backlash as well on social media when you perhaps haven't performed so well in a game and, you know? I mean, I, yeah, I mean, it comes, it comes with the territory, right? Mm -hmm. you, you, have to, you have to expect that there are gonna be the critics and not all of them are gonna be on your side, right? Um, I guess what you have to do, I mean, you gotta be mentally strong to be able to tune that kind of stuff out because if you start letting that stuff affect you, then it's gonna affect your game. It's gonna affect everything that you're doing um, and everything around you, right? So, I mean, that's, the, that's tough. And I can not imagine what those players must be feeling, you know? Um, you know if, you, you go down the line of that whole tournament, I feel, you know, I mean, there were so many that went into penalty kicks and so many of the players that must feel like they let their country down right now, you know, um, that that'll stick with players, you know, for the rest of their lives. And it has been talked about whether, you know, whether games should end, like big games like this should end in penalty kicks, right? Because uh, players shouldn't have to carry that sort of pressure on them. You know, I mean, you imagine <laughs> it's it's tough. It's the pressure, Akiko, is the pressure um, worse in an individual sport as such as swimming? Although I, I know it is a team sport in some events, whereas football is a, is a team sport. Yeah, I don't, I, I, it's hard for me to comment on how it would vary for a team sport because I've only known mm -hmm. uh, a, a single sport, but I have to, you know, I just chiming in, you know, my own at the 1991 Manila Southeast Asian Games, mm -hmm. um, you know, the country, Philippines lost the overall title by one goal. At those games, I won two golds and two silvers by a hairline in the 50 meter freestyle and you know, I came back to the hotel we were staying at, and this uh, bellboy says to me, "Mom, bakit ka nag second?" And you know, and, and and you know, I know they don't they don't mean it that way, but mm -hmm. you know, when if we're an athlete, you, you you think about all this like, oh my gosh, you know, you you feel like you let down the country. You feel like, man, if I won those one gold, we would have tied two golds. I would have, you know. So, but but. So it was a very painful lesson for me. I went to the room, I just was crying, but it made me realize also and reflect why I was swimming and who I was swimming for. And then ultimately, you know, all I could ask of myself was just to do my best and that was more than enough. But, you know, just getting to that point uh, took a lot of just, you know, uh, real self-reflecting and realizing uh, the why of, why I was doing what I was doing and, and that it was more than enough. But does anyone want to chime in? Maybe? Yeah, well, yeah let Dr. me Tasha. comment on that. Yeah, sure. well, well, based on studies. 
Um, they do say that individual sport athletes would actually tend to be a bit more or they are more prone to psychological stress more because they attribute it or the, at least the failure to themselves. Unlike if it's sports, uh, if it's a team sports, um, you know, that there is diffusion of responsibility. Like, you know, you also had your share of why you actually didn't make it. No. Um, but like Akiko mentioned, really it's, um, again, with the eco ecosystem that I mentioned, it we may also be dependent on how the individual views that failure per se but yeah, just generally yeah they say that individual sports are somewhat much more tough as compared with your um group or your um team sports but the fans also play a role right the fans can be incredibly encouraging but they can also deflate your you know your ego just like that mm -hmm. so how do you how do you guys deal with that I mean, and it's been said that Filipinos have no filter, right? So they just say these things like that, that bellboy said to you. Is there any way, and then, Natasha, I mean, mental health is like a whole, like you said, it, it takes a village, right? So, you know, do fans also, fans also have to be, have to realize that TJ, maybe you can chime in here. Fans also have to realize that their role in the mental health of, of athletes. Okay, yeah, they, parts of the, go, go ahead, DJ. <laughs> I, I, I do, but it's it's tricky. It's it as athletes, as sports teams and sports leagues, they have little control over that. They may have some influence in cultivating the culture if they can do it mindfully and actually make that a plan of you know messaging, you know, moving forward. Like for example, here in the NBA, when the playoffs started, there were high incidences of fans throwing whatever to the players, which is really, really odd and rare. We're used to that in the Philippines in the 70s and the 80s when they're throwing peso coins and bottles to Toyota and Crispa back then. But but here, this like totally out of nowhere. And, you know, they were attributing it to the pandemic and it's the first time they're watching a live sporting event again. But there was a very powerful message sent back right away by the league, by ESPN, by a lot of the players, and, and they, they condemned you know, the, the, the Flues fans were banned from the arenas for life, things like that. So it, it may take something, I mean, that's a different thing altogether, but it may take something like that, like a concerted effort from teams and individual players to, you know, basically send the message of, of root, you know, respectfully and lovingly. And if there's failures, you know, accept that it's part of the sport, you know, and, and it's going to take time. It's going to take time to plant those seeds. And it's, 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 it's not limited to sports we can see it in political discourse we can mm -hmm. see it the way people rant about you know they buy a you know a burger from a fast food chain and it just doesn't taste right and they're going to rant like it's the worst thing they ever spent 30 pence on or whatever right so mm -hmm. you know, the power of social media has given people so much bravado whether it's they're anonymous or not or hiding behind a name and an egg whatever but yeah it, it's 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 become a sociological phenomenon let's put it that way and it's not isolated to sports but i think sports is an interesting you know arena to look at it and how it's evolving and how it's it's really mirroring all of life so the, all that trash talking and, and hard you know harsh discussions it's not limited to sports but you know i'm curious to see how victor and natasha sees it and how you know what can be done i mean it's gonna take a while for sure but i'm sure there are steps to do something about it yeah definitely so that's like I mentioned, like everyone can and should help. So that includes really our, you know, our fans and even just you know, a usual spectator, right? Because they're part of our, you know, their exo system, their our exo and our macro system, really. So yeah, yeah, I agree with you. you know, it would really take a while, but that's why also um, we have to grab the opportunity that this social media we can actually use this really to also spread. If it can spread, you know, like hate and something, right? We can also do good with it. Um, so really just really sharing and educating our audience, you know, about how like one little word can really be very helpful for each and every one. Rabina, you know, I'll just add there, I think, you know, just the athlete having a good uh, community around them kind of to help them process and to help them filter, you know, what what should just be in an, in one ear, out the other ear, or, you know, I mean, just giving perspective because sometimes it's a little bit harder when you're in the middle of it, of it all. I agree with Akiko. That was actually the first thing I thought of 
in the last two incidences. One was when the Philadelphia 76ers lost. And I think Anton would be more aware of this. When Ben Simmons, their star player, was blamed for the loss because he missed like a million free throws. And I was already, I was worried for his mental health because he was already getting, getting bashed, not just by the opponents, but by the loyal fans of Philadelphia. And same with the three, you know, African-American, uh, or sorry, African-Brit uh, players of the British team. I was, right away, I was worried for them. And I was hoping, God, I hope they have a good support system to take care of them and support psychologists on that team to really isolate them, at least for the next few days or weeks, to make sure and check in on them because that magnitude of hate can really, really be very mm-hmm. triggering. But Anton, have you been in that penalty shootout situation? And if you have, how have you like dealt with it? Because so much is resting on your shoulders. The pressure I mean, must uh, be intense. Yeah, I mean, it's it's it's. I guess it's what some players live for, and what some players avoid, right? Um, I I just happen to be one of those in the middle, right? <laughs> um, I was one of those. Hey, if I get picked, I get picked. I got to do the job, right? Um, of course, the pressure is there, um, and I mean, it's it's like I said though, it's 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 what we train our lives for, right? We train all our lives to be able to get to these points where we have to prepare ourselves to understand. Hey, we could fail here, and if we fail, these are the outcomes that could happen, and we got to be prepared to deal with it because if we're not prepared to deal with it, then it's something that we have to second guess and think about whether it's what we should be doing. Right. I, I really think it, it, it should get to that point. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's fun though. I love it. I like the pressure. <laughs> well, I, 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 how do you uh, go ahead, DJ? Sorry. Go ahead. Well, I mean, one thing I learned, um, a few years ago from uh, from the same podcast I mentioned earlier, interviewed uh, Michael Phelps, is Tim Ferriss. He talks a lot about fear setting. There's so much in old school discussions about goal setting and setting your goals, but he talks about fear setting and really drawing it out in a whiteboard and seat, re- literally writing it down and what am I afraid of and why and then why and then why. And when you break it all down, you're like, what am I afraid of? You know, when, when you, you know, it, it, it makes it mon- very visual when you see it in on print rather than just it in your head but, oh no it's not that bad after all you know it, this may happen but fine it's not not gonna scare me that much and then when you do that it lessens the pressure before you enter that endeavor whether it's investing in a new business whether it's enter, entering a sporting event or whatever it is just having that fear setting that knowing what is out there as, as Anton said then you can be present and in the moment and just deal with it and just enjoy you know what is right in front of you but what about the mental fortitude that you need to power through an injury? You're in sports and injuries are inevitable. And sometimes you have to perform at a big game or a big meet while injured. And, you know, sometimes you, you don't even want to admit you have that injury because you want to power through. So how do you how do you deal with that? Because as Tony was saying, it could actually lead to a worse injury, right? By, by continuing to, to compete without getting it attended to. But it, it's there, there's a combination of physical and mental together trying to cover up another kind of issue, right? Um, that's not, <laughs> no, that's nobody wants to talk about the physical side. I mean, I can talk I, about the physical side all day, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can imagine, yeah. I mean, great, great. Um, a little story uh last season in our bubble um first game uh we end up playing kaya and i think about the 60th minute um i just have someone pull on my hand right and we think it's i thought it was broken but our trainer everybody thought it was just a dislocation right and i couldn't leave the bubble for the whole duration because if I left the bubble, then I wouldn't have been able to play in the games. So we were treating it like it was a dislocation. We were pulling it, pushing down, pulling it, pushing down. End of the end of the season, well, our short season of five games, I go get the x-ray and sure enough, it's just, it's super crap. <laughs> yeah, it's completely oh, broken. No. But I mean, this is where it comes down to, I mean, you know, 
I think a lot depends on, you know, a role of a player, right? I'm the old man out there. I have to be a leader. If I wasn't that old man, would I have stuck through it and dealt with it? Or would I have left the field, you know? So, I mean, this comes into what kind of roles you also have to play on the field, you know, as, as TJ was saying, you step into these things and Eric Spolestra said, you have to compartmentalize, you know, you have to know your roles. You not, you need to know what you have to do. And, you know, I'm not there to be able to win games because I'm the old man on the field, you know, <laughs> I can't run so much, but I have to be able to show that we're tough. Right. And if that, means that I have to stay out there on the field to be an example for the rest of the team, then that's what we have to do, you know? And that's where that mental, the mental side comes in, right? Yeah. Akiko, you wanted to say something? Uh, no, not really. I mean, I fortunately, in, in my um, experience in sport, I've never got injured. Very thankfully, wow. uh, never. Great. Yeah, uh, and I attribute that to just doing a lot of drills and just making sure you know stroke technique was very important. But I, I think also, may, I would imagine that you would need like a, a sports physician to just to see also how I mean, because you don't want it to progress into something that will be mm -hmm. completely damaging uh, in the long run for your long career, term. long term wise. So you know, I mean. But um, Anton's situation, that's, that's, I mean, you're in a bubble. What can you do, you know? So it, it's, it's hard to just, uh, yeah, give, give a, one answer to, to the question. To power through the pain kind of thing, right? Ouch. That sounds really painful, Anton. I hope your, your, your hand's okay now. It's all, it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's shorter than my other fingers now. <laughs> <laughs> now um, and we have a couple of questions here. There's one interesting question here about a newspaper says 30 billion pesos for Olympic gold in Tokyo, which may even go up to 50 million. Does such extrinsic motivation affect mental health before, during, or after the games? If so, how far should such extrinsic motivation be allowed? Interesting. Oh. That's a hard question. I know this. That's I know Attorney Africa very well, so I'm not surprised that that question's <laughs> coming from him. But you know, I I just my thought. Um, you can't control the people. I think it's a, a a nationwide desire and hunger for that gold. And you know, people will just because they want it so bad. You know, I uh, I think it's from one on, but put in the, the extra 10 million. So that's beyond our control. But I think it's just, it's, it's important for athletes to, to know their self-worth and, and that, and the why of what they're doing, that even if they don't achieve it, we're so proud of them. I mean, cause we know all the effort, the sacrifices that have, have uh, gone into it. Um, and so I, I, you know, I realize that you can't, you, what can you control and what can't you control? But I think it's good to, to make sure that the athletes know that um, whether or not they achieve it, we're proud of them. And this is not, you know, they need to know and, and go through that whole process of, of knowing why they're doing what they're doing and th there's their value, you know? I mean, um, weightlifting, swimming, whatnot, doesn't define who I am as a, a human being. It's a huge part of who I am and it's, it's shaped the person that I am, but it's not, it's not, that's not all. But Natasha, Dr. Natasha, do many mm -hmm. athletes kind of realize that in the end that they're, like you were saying, you're more than just the sport you play, but some, some people allow it to define them and they don't know anything else, right? Yeah. That's where um, we do need to help them, right? That's why, again, part of the culture of mental toughness, we do need to help um, our athletes because for some really um, money may be the motivation. They don't really know their why, why they're actually doing it or that they're really good at it. You know, they're just really getting um, motivation from other people like do this because either their parents told them to do so or do this because, you know, that will put food in our table or do this because... Um, you know, that's the only thing vacant for you to really go to school. You know, um, a lot of 
things can factor in really. Um, that's why we do need to help them really, yeah, as, as you mentioned, really understand why they're doing it and that they are really beyond and more than what they're doing. You know, they're more than the sports that they're actually playing. So the, it's really our role also to really help them understand that and really appreciate that, you know, um, it's not all that there is to it, you know. So, yeah, we do need to support our, because it's good, uh, at least uh, for our athletes here, they do have the privilege to really um, get this good um, support. Like they have um, their team, they have, you know, they have everything. That's why they do also have good mental um they do have good mental health but for some it would not be as they would not be as privileged you know to to have this so yeah that's why very important again to just really you know take care of their mental health and again prevent if we can actually do you know even if even before it happens if we can just screen them you know just really engaging in some simple sports you know just um, asking them why they're actually doing it and other motivations and just figuring out their own identity, you know, beyond the sport, that would really be very helpful. But DJ, have you seen anyone, I mean, in, in the course of your career, like, can you tell when it's really all about the money or it's about the sport? Are you able to, you know, when you're interviewing athletes or or it's really a combination of both? I mean, you've inter you've, I'm sure you've met the, you know, super big league athletes and who are, you know, paid like, astronomical um, rates, right? It's, it's tough, but um, I'd like to believe that it's still more about the passion for the sport, especially for the ones who succeed and continue to succeed. There's, there's that, you know, there's a reason why they're, up to, they're on top of their game. Um, and, and more often than not, they have a good balance of, of what they need in terms of the physical support, the strength coaches, the nutritionists, and even nowadays, the last many years, they have their yoga teachers, their their meditation teachers, and their you know their life coaches as well. I remember, um, man, it was like eight years ago. As in, in the Philippines, I met this life coach from the U.S. who happened to be Kobe Bryant's life coach. And that back then, it wasn't sexy to have a life coach. You know, this is in 2012. So, not in the also among a mindfulness, mindful stuff like that. But but there were already elite athletes who were investing in that. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'd like to believe that it's really all about the passion for the game um, and, and, and the joy of winning and bringing pride to your, your team, your city, your corporate sponsor, or your country, um, and, and that it should be little to do with the actual money that they make. I mean, it's, actually, there's not that many sports that, like, for example, like boxing or, or other sports that money is tied to an actual event. As opposed to you know professional teams, you know they they play and they get paid whatever happens. Although there are bonuses along the way if they reach the finals, semifinals, but mm -hmm. but for the most part, ninety percent of athletes get paid for their performance per se, regardless if they win or lose or you know for that year. So yeah, I, I I'm I'm just all this optimistic guy who would like to think that it's it's for the passion and for that they love what they do. Um, but as Akiko I said, the key there now though the key message the younger athletes need to know is that they're more than that. They're more than that. That they can't just get trapped in thinking, I am this and this is life. You know, I am a swimmer and that's all that life is. Or I am a, um, you know, soccer player and that's all that life is. But they have to realize it will, there will come a time that there'll be more to it than that. And that when their career starts slowing down, they have to realize that there's, there's, there's other things they're going to have to learn to do, right? And to be a fully functioning, you know, well-balanced human being. Does it start when you're, it must start when you're very young, because a lot of athletes are, their, their talents come out, when the potential comes out when they're young, right? And how do you also balance that? I guess, Dr. Tasha, you have to speak to the parents as well, right? To, to prepare mm -hmm. these kids. So it's yeah. not just, hey, go, you know, go out there and swim or go out there, play football, go out there and, and shoot some hoops, you know, mm -hmm. there's, and then you have to also, maybe the coach is also important, the trainer and the coach, right? So. How do you how do you guide parents to get a team to I mean a support team together for for young potential you know elite athletes? Uh, well, mostly really just you know one thing is just really talking about it. <laughs> you know, um, again, it's still a stigma about 
talk just stigmatizing you know, talking, it yeah. yeah just be stigmatizing and like it's okay to talk about it like if if their child is actually feeling a bit sad you know um just having an open communication about it that's really very helpful and that's one thing that we always discuss also with the parents you know so that really their children would come to them especially again during adolescence where in you know the child or the adolescent really tends to shy away from the parents at this time um you know um as part of the as part of nature right um they're trying to find their identity so you know they somewhat don't like their parents at this time but you know just having this open communication with them that would really be very helpful and um you know um just really advising them also that they can also help their um or they that they are part of their child's growth and development you know that would really be very helpful also but anton have you seen that with younger kids wanting to play football also and you know maybe not having the the skills mentally to to adapt to the pressures of the game i mean yes of course uh and that's why they're they're you know only a handful that actually make it right mm -hmm. um that, that's 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 why they are uh you know that's why elite athletes become elite athletes right mm -hmm. because i really think it's it's because they're mentally strong you know Men, men, being mentally strong is is i think is 80% of what you need at the top level right um to be able to be confident to be able to know that you can do it to be able to deal with the pressures to be able to deal with all the negative situations that will come your way right that's all mentally um and as an elite player they they prepare for that so you do see a lot of fall off right um and that's why those the top and then there's the rest of them that don't make it and the rest of them that don't make it they are going to go through these hardships right um and these hardships you you can't avoid because it's all uh life learning lessons you know mm -hmm. lessons along the way and these lessons mold you into the person that you become right um yeah. and you you won't if you have someone holding your hand the whole way through you're not going to be able to learn these lessons on your own right and i think these people i mean as much as we talk about avoiding mental health i think there are a lot of things that people do need to also understand that um these kids need to run into and learn these failures and learn these defeats because it sort of molds them into a person they are so it's not being there all the time but you know um being there when they really need it and like you know TJ was saying you know talk it's it's what we really need the players to do right if there is an issue come out and talk right there was that stigma of male athletes and it looking to be you know uh in a way shaming a male athlete no you know talk about it that's what that's what this world's about now you know it's it's very much becoming a very more open world and we hope that people it becoming more open people are more open to talk about these situations mm -hmm. right and i think uh and i think we are going in that right direction yeah ambina can i just add to anton aside from talking about it i think it's also about listening you know especially as parents too um it's mm -hmm. i find it so hard you know how do you i mean coaching your child you know and and uh and i agree with everything anton said um you know the lessons they learn out there <clears throat> uh, but also i guess it's also a matter of the age of the child you know i mean my my boys are young and so for me it's 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 also about you know commitment you start something you show up you know and 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 so i guess uh as it progresses it obviously you know uh it becomes a different uh thing and but i i i realize we're also so dependent also on the coaches you know i think it really is a community um if uh, uh parents noticing something maybe with their child and you know i think it's okay i i always hold myself back cuz i i'm so self conscious about being that um helicopter you know whatever and i do not want to be that you know but sometimes i think it's it's good to just to communicate to the coach 
just to let them know maybe they're seeing something that we're not seeing. Uh, but yeah, sorry, going back, I think it's talking and listening to um, and, and letting them know that it's okay, you know, and just, yeah, listening. I think also a mind shift because you, you can have all that, but if you have a coach that's abusive, right? I mean, that's also an old way of, of coaching, maybe more for team sport. Or you hear about these things like in gymnastics and, you know, things like that. So, you know, it has to be a concerted effort as well. And you have, you might have a dinosaur of a coach stuck in the old ways and thinking the more he puts you down, the more motivated you'll be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, every, all the elements kind of have to, you know, um, make a concerted effort to be more open, to talk about it, to listen, as you said, which is, which is a great point. Um, I think we're going to close soon. And I just wanted to thank you all for being with us today. And thank you for all your insights um, and a glimpse into the world of the elite athlete, which I'll never be a part of, obviously. But um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But thank you for the lessons that you've imparted today. Um, and TJ, also for your own journey and your own observations in your, your long career. Um, I also, before we close, I just wanted to say um, on behalf of Manila House, thank you very much. And from CMI, Centre Medical International. And this talk will be up in YouTube, on YouTube on a couple, in a couple of days. And um, just maybe can I ask everyone to give their last words? Like, what would you advise? What advice would you give to somebody who wanted to get into your sport or your career and sort of really be the next greatest football player, swimmer, broadcast, sportscaster, you know, what advice would you give? I guess I'll start so then we can we can leave the better speakers to the end <laughs> all right uh, no I mean you know uh, a lot of this stuff which we talked about today was very you know um, just just to prepare kids and youth or other athletes what they can expect right don't think that this is going to happen all the time or to everybody right um, so I don't, we don't want to scare people off of being athletes here, right? But this, these are things to expect when becoming an athlete. So like others spoke about earlier, take the key points, you know, make sure you talk to people. If you have an issue, if you have a situation, like Akiko said, if, if you're not the one with the issue, make sure you're listening, right? And then finding your support group, right? being able to know what to filter out and what to keep in, and then taking out the positives of something. And lastly, I think it's being able to understand, you know, the guy above, he creates a path for you. And if you understand that path and you believe in that path, it's going to take you to where you belong, right? It's gonna have the ups and downs and the life lessons, but if you're mentally fit, and if you're if you're for it, then then you'll be it, right? Thank you very much. Appreciate thanks, it. Thanks, Anton. Thanks for your time. Thanks for joining us today. Akiko, did you want to add something? Yeah. Well, just very briefly, just want to um, echoing what Anton said. You know, sports. I would still encourage parents and people to get their child into sports. There's just so many life lessons that they learn, uh, skills that they learn, and just they learn more about themselves. And I really. I know as cliche as it sounds, it really sets them up well for, for life because there's just so many um, similar setting goals, failure, whatever, uh, that, that really um, they get exposed to at a, at a young age. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, God, I really believe God has given us all different talents, different uh, skills that you know it's 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 our responsibility to nurture and to develop them um, and be the best version of ourselves that we can be um, yeah so I I, 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 uh, I know I should tie this in with mental mental wellness um, but I guess I guess bringing it back to that it's always should they become really uh, should sports become a big thing and they become really competitive at it you know it's it's so important uh that they remember the why of what they're doing and that they really um 
they're, they're, they're more than just, I mean, it's a huge part. I know I'm repeating myself, but really um, this is just one aspect, one chapter of their life. And God can also use this um, in the next chapters of their lives. Thanks. Thanks, Akiko. Thanks so much for that. Um, DJ? Uh, well, you know, thanks, Akiko, for bringing that up because I was, you know, I was an athlete too. I was a soccer player and basketball player in high school and college and wasn't good enough to be part of the elite, but I had the second best career <laughs> reporting on the sidelines and I'm still enjoying it to this day. But, but I think that the key there is one message we, we want to share is that, you know, find your passion, um, find what you're good at, um, and, and eventually... You know, I recently learned this from 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 some you know personal development coaches I listen to. It, when you're looking, when some people when they're seeking deep for their purpose, they realize it's in their gifts. It's what they've been God gave them <laughs> that they're good at, and it's like a no-brainer. That is their purpose, and, and use that to make an impact in other people's lives. And then, more often than not, you know, the happiness and productivity and stability comes with that. Um, but you know, I mean, just you know, as a, as a side note, you asked about you know advice for careers i mean if you want to get into any kind of broadcasting you know just just learn the best uh the most out of that particular topic you want to be good at i mean if i've heard this out of the box advice before from from older journalists they said don't take journalism don't take mass communications you can learn those things on the fly because look at nowadays if you took up mass comm in 1980 you're you're now practicing journalism 2010 you're relearning everything because things are so different with all the technology and all that but it's the core expertise in that subject matter that you bring with you that, that gives you that head start really if whether it's in science or in climate change or in sports or economics or whatnot you know then you can get a head start into that you know broadcasting field but at, again at the end of the day just just you know be, be true to yourself find what what um what uh, makes you excited to wake up in the morning and for the parents out there for the as akiko mentioned the helicopter parents out there i hope parenting also evolves and 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 you know learns to listen to kids more. Uh, I, I know so many stories of kids being forced to be that they're not, forced to be a doctor, forced to be a lawyer, forced to be this and that, but their love is something else. So at the end of the day, it's just really listening, you know, and understanding what your kids desire and what they may be good at and gifted at. So thanks again, Babina, for having this. And I'm sure we'll be spurring this conversation, you know, and keeping it moving. Thank you. Yes, I'd love to continue this conversation. I'd like to thank really all of you um, for being here today. And Dr. Tasha, do you want to round it all off for us it before we close? The of rounding it up. Uh, well, just picking up from what EJ mentioned, really just find your passion, you know, but it doesn't matter who you become or what you become, as long as it's what's important is you also take care of your own mental health, mm -hmm. right? And if you do know how to take care of your own mental health, just like anyone and everyone, you can also be part or you can also take care of other people's mental health, you know, because anyone and everyone should be taking care of each other's mental health as well. And Thanks. agree. I think on that note, oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, just one last. Agree about taking up sports mm -hmm. <laughs> as well. So really a good thing for our kids. And really, um, well, aside from the physical activity, really just also um, encouraging their mental health as well, you know. Mm -hmm. No, and I think we've all suffered because of COVID being on lockdown. And so if I think now they've opened up um, public spaces for kids and, and well, for everyone now who's been vaccinated, especially. So I think it's really important to get out there and get moving also for our own sanity, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and as Akiko said, um, which is very true, be kind to yourself. It is a time for everyone to be kind to each other and to be kind to ourselves. Um, so on that note, again, I've said this so many times, but I'm really grateful to all of you for joining us today and being part of this, this discussion. And um, I hope to see you all again. So on behalf of Manila House and CMI, thank you very, very much for your time and your insights and your candor. Very, very much appreciated. And see you next time. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Great seeing all Thank of you, you. Akiko, TJ. Good to see you, Ancho, hey, TJ. Good to see you guys. We got, we got to the kids over there. Yeah. No, <laughs> tomorrow too. Bye. Tasha, yeah. See you guys. Take care. Okay. Bye, Bambina. Bye. 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 Nice seeing you, Anton. Bye. Bye. Yeah.